Grover, I lift up prayers for the family of Carl Brandt, uh, my friend who died on Wednesday. I'm sorry. Uh, Julie lifts up prayers for co-worker whose father has suffered many strokes and daughter needs our daughter who needs our prayers. Uh, prayers for strength, peace, and faith in the unknown. Uh, Brenda Holfers lifts up prayers for her husband uh, after open heart surgery. He's recovering and should get to come home today. Um, and Ann Santos uh, lifts up prayers uh, for the family of her brother. Uh, Ann's brother Bud passed away on Tuesday. And he would have been 74 on Wednesday. So in prayer for, for Ann and for uh, all of her family. These are our prayers. Let's lift them up to the Lord. A couple of praises. Linda Malconian lifts up praise. Uh, my sister Cheryl's surgery went well, and she is home recuperating. All right. Um, there's a praise, uh, praise that this Easter is so much more joyous than last year. All right. And then another praise. Uh, this one is from Kinsley. Uh, our acolyte today that lit the candles, uh, she says, she just simply says, thank you, God, for your son. All right. These are our praises. Let's lift them up to the Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amen. I'm going to pause for a moment of silent prayer. And in the silence, as always, I encourage each of us to uh, simply open our hearts to God and uh, lift up unspoken prayer concerns or praises. Mighty God, we thank you that you are here with us in this place. We thank you that we serve a risen Savior and a living God, one present with us. Lord, as you walk with us through this life, we pray that you, that you might help us to bear our burdens, that you might share our celebrations, that our load may be bearable, and that our joy might be complete. We thank you for this, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite, uh, I'm going to invite uh, all those who have been practicing the Lord's Prayer in American Sign Language to come on up. Uh, Miss Kevin has been teaching some of us to, uh, I say some of us, some of you, to um, sign the Lord's Prayer in American Sign Language. And so um, I'm going to invite the rest of us to, uh, to, to stand up as, as we join them. Now, and I usually use this moment uh, in the worship service to remind people that, that uh, you know, in a liturgical worship service, we do a lot of standing and sitting, don't we? It's like stand and sit. It's so, it, it serves two purposes. One, it keeps your blood flowing so you don't fall asleep too quickly when the sermon starts. But the other thing it does is it symbolically unites us. When we stand, we become one. And that is the liturgical meaning of of standing in a liturgical worship service. So with that, we become one as we sing the Lord's Prayer together today.
right, thank you. Uh, please be seated once again. Our choir now is going to bless us with our anthem this morning. <laughs> Please stand as you're feeling comfortable today for today's scripture. Today's word comes to us from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings laying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up 
in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated once again. All right, something unexpected happened for, uh, for Mary, for Peter, for John, for all the disciples on that, that very first Easter morning. And um, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, if we look at Peter and John, you know, We tend to think mainly about Mary and her experience and, and, and the empty tomb. She's in the garden talking with Jesus. Why would, we don't oftentimes think of, of James, I mean of John and Peter running to the tomb. But John in his gospel devotes 10 verses. Uh, you know, 10 verses of precious parchment is, are, is devoted to he and Peter running toward the tomb. This is my favorite uh, picture, favorite painting of Easter, of the Easter events. It's, it's not a painting of an empty tomb. It's not a, it's not a painting of, of two angels uh, sitting on either side of, a, of a, a folded up piece of linen. It's not a painting of, of Mary and, and her garden encounter with Jesus. It's a painting of John and Peter as they, they run to the tomb. And for me, what, what is especially uh, meaningful for me about this painting, it's a Swiss painter. His name is Bernand. Uh, what, what makes it, it's, and it's, it's, it's undoubtedly his most famous painting, but what makes it special to me is their faces. If you look at their faces, uh, look, at, look at John's face and look at Peter's face. Now John is the younger of the two, uh, he's described throughout, throughout the Gospel of John, he's described as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I've got to imagine that, that Jesus loved him because of, of his youthfulness. Um, John, John was the youngest of the disciples, uh, a teenager, maybe a very young teenager. And, and Jesus, you know, you know how we love children? I believe that Jesus loved John especially because of that, because he was a child compared to these grown men. And he, he, was, he was giving his life to, to this kingdom cause. But look at the face of John. He, he, he runs as someone who runs for love. He runs as someone who runs for, for a love that has been lost. And, and, and look at his face. He, he's, there's this desperate sort of hope on his face. Now look at Peter. 
Look at Peter's face. Peter has a look of, 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 of he doesn't know what to expect. You know, Peter is the guy with the most to lose and the most to gain. Okay, if, now, they, they, the Bible says that even though they believed, they, they didn't yet know that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So, he, so, you know, Peter doesn't know exactly that Jesus has risen yet, but, but he knows that the tomb is empty. And it opens up all these possibilities for Peter. What is, what is, what is Peter thinking? And why, why does he run? And I, and I think that, that there is just this, this tremendous anxiety for Peter as he's running towards the tomb. They get to the tomb, and, and yes, they find it as it was described to them by Mary. The stone is rolled away, and the tomb is empty. I, I like the fact that, that John gets there first, and he looks inside, but he doesn't go in. But, but Peter needs to go. He, he needs to know that tomb is empty. Peter pushes him aside, jumps down into the, into the, the, the tomb, and, and it's almost like he's got to fill. It's a tiny place. Okay, it's not very big, but it's almost as if, it's as if Peter has to be in there. Peter has to fill it with his presence. Peter has to fill that space with his body so he knows without a doubt that the tomb is definitely empty. He sees that, that, that linen cloth rolled up and, and the scripture says that he believed. He didn't, know, he didn't know yet, he didn't understand yet that Christ had to rise from the dead. But he believed. He believed that the tomb was indeed empty. What were they expecting? I wonder, what were they expecting? You know, as Christians, we, we have the benefit of 2,000 years of, of hindsight. We look upon this and we say, yeah, the, the, uh, the empty tomb, it's empty and it, it is, and the risen Lord Jesus Christ, it's guarantee of our salvation. It is, it is evidence. It is our guarantee that our faith is rewarded. It's a guarantee of, of eternal life. It's a guarantee of forgiveness of sins. It's a guarantee of salvation. But I want to say that I believe that, that Peter, Peter and the other disciples knew it was something, something more. Yes, it was personal, okay, but it was more than personal. Yes, it, it, was, it had to be personal for Peter. I guarantee you it had to be personal for Peter. We can all see that. I mean, like I said, he is the one with the most to lose. He had denied Jesus three times. You know, he was the guy that said, you know, Jesus, I will fight with you. you know, he was the guy that pulled out his sword, you know, when, he, when, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter pulls out his sword and he starts fighting. And Jesus says, no, wait, don't. So he, you know, Peter made good on his promise. He said, I'm ready to fight. When, when he made that promise, he, he made a promise to fight for Jesus. But, but he didn't realize that when he made that promise, what it was was a promise to die. And he wasn't ready for that. And so when it came right down to it, he denied that he knew Jesus, you know, three times. Even the last time he denied Jesus, the third time he denied Jesus with an oath, with a curse. And, and, and just then Jesus looked at Peter. The cock crowed as, as Jesus said it would. And Peter looked at Jesus and saw that I can't imagine the look on Jesus' face. Jesus in Luke's gospel in chapter 22... <laughs> One of my, you know, as we as we as we go through life, sometimes our our favorite verses in the Bible change. But at one time in my life, this was my favorite verse in the Bible. It was chapter twenty-two in Luke's Gospel, verse thirty-two, when when Jesus has told Peter that he's going to deny him three times. But and it, but he says this. He says, "But I have prayed for you, that your own faith may not fail." And you, once you have returned back, strengthen your brothers. And I, I can imagine that, that as, as he's running toward that tomb, those words are coming into his mind, but I have prayed for you that, that your faith may not fail. And so as Peter is running towards that tomb with a faith that is on life support, uh, those words are coming back to him. Yes, it's more than personal. Yes, for, for Peter it is personal, but it's more than that. Now, I know that Peter wants to, to, to come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, man, you were right. It happened just like you said it would play out. It did, but it's more than that. All of the disciples knew that Jesus had talked for three years about, about something more than just a personal salvation. Jesus had talked and taught for three years about this thing called the kingdom of God. 
It had a meaning for all of them. They all knew from, their, from the traditions of their past that there was this kingdom of God and, and that the Messiah was going to, be, was going to, it was going to inaugurate, initiate this, this kingdom of God, bring it upon the earth. They, they knew that. Jesus taught for three years about that. I say it over and over again. Jesus didn't die. He, Jesus didn't get crucified because he started a forgiveness movement. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't get crucified because he said, I'll forgive your sins. Jesus got crucified because he ignited this kingdom of God movement. Because, because he rode into Jerusalem a week before this. He rode into to, to Jerusalem riding on a donkey with people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus owned it. And he said, yes, I am that king. And the powers that be responded the way that powers that be typically respond. They gave Jesus a crown of thorns and they nailed him to his throne. But, but you see, the empty tomb is our guarantee, is our proof is, uh, of something more than salvation. You see, the, the empty tomb is guarantee, is evidence that the kingdom power is victorious over the powers that be. That the kingdom of God has, has power over all of that. Yes, personal salvation is in there, is in that, but it's so much more than something personal. And I know that there's, that, you know, we all know that if, if we were the only sinner on earth, Jesus would have, would have died and risen again just for us. But it's more than that, you see, because we're not the only sinner on earth. The kingdom of God has been opened to all of us. And that kingdom power is victorious. You know, the, the, there, there was this, this something unexpected that, that was experienced. Mary and all the disciples experienced this unexpected joy. Their, their world was dark. Their world was defeated. Their, their world was, was locked up in that tomb just like Jesus. And, and they experienced this joy, this, this resurrection of hope. That, you know, that faith on life support that Peter had, that was, that was breathed into and given new life. They, they experience this, this unexpected joy that comes when, when the possibilities for the future are opened up. Yeah. The disciples, they, they all experienced an unexpected power as well in the verses that follow immediately, the verses that were read today. Uh, we see that Jesus enters into their midst. Uh, behind locked doors, the, the disciples are gathered, and John says that, that even though the doors were locked, Jesus appears and stands in their midst. And he breathes upon them the Holy Spirit. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. There's this, this power that comes to them, and, and, and he says, this power I give to you. Wow. It's, it's the power of the kingdom of God. That's that same power that is victorious, that same, that same power that Jesus displayed as he as he taught for three years, the, that same power is theirs, a power to, to heal the sick, a power to cause the blind to see, a power to, to, to heal the lame, a power to raise the dead. Oh, it's kingdom power. It, it's an unexpected power. It is theirs. Yes. So what are we expecting? Are we expecting something unexpected today? Are we expecting something Something phenomenal? Are we expecting something miraculous? Or is, is this a day like, well, it's like, it's like the coolest Sunday ever to go, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the good Sunday to go. To, if you're going to go to church on, sun, on a Sunday and pick out one Sunday a year, man, this is, the, this is Sunday I would go. You know, it, you know, what are we expecting, though? It's, you know, it seems, like, it seems like the powers that be are attacking us in our world today. Sounds like, it seems like, like the powers that be, you know, are, are, are everywhere. You know, what are we expecting today as we consider what's going on in the world? And we, you know, we come to church today because we, we, need, to, we need some assurance. We need some, we need some, some hope for the future. Um, you know, I, I, I watch the evening news and uh, the, uh, the network news, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS, it's, 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 it, there's this format that they have, and I, I, I like it. It's cool. I mean, I, I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, let's say that the whole broadcast is 30 minutes. Let's say, you, let's say you actually got 30 minutes of news, okay? Well, their format is this. So for 29 minutes and 30 seconds, 
You get war, you get suffering, you get death, you get conflict, you get, you get protests, you know, you, you, you get all that, okay. And in that last 30 seconds, they leave you with a feel-good story, you know? It's like that, have you ever noticed that, that last story in the newscast, you got to wait through a few commercials to get it, but that last little 30 seconds, it's going to be a feel-good thing, you know? And, and, and you go, you know, that was sure depressing. That was, you know, that was horrible news, but somehow I feel, for some reason I feel okay, you know? So, so for some reason I feel, I feel okay about that. And, but there is like this, uh, this positive thing at the end that, that kind of makes the rest of it, go down a little bit better. What's that old saying? A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down? Okay. Um, let me ask you, the reason I bring that up, is that what this is? Is, is that the sort of thing that, that Easter is? Is Easter like this little thing that, that happens in the midst of all of our, our Good Friday, you know, darkness of the tomb sort of living that we do, that we go through the world in every day of the rest of the year? Is, is like is like... Easter Sunday, is it like that, that little 30 seconds at the end that, that kind of makes you feel good and gives you hope for the rest of the time? I say, no, it's got to be more than that. You know, it, it, this kingdom power that, that, that made that tomb empty has got to be ours. There's got to, you know, I want to know that, that God is still moving mountains. You know, I, I want to I know that, that, that the fortresses of the enemies of God still fall at, at the command of Jesus. That, and when I say the enemies of God, I'm talking about spiritual enemies. I'm talking about darkness. I want to know that, that, that God is still raising the dead. You know, I want to know that. And that's what I want to know when I come to the tomb. What are we expecting today? I'll have to admit, there was a time in my life, okay, when I didn't expect much, all right? Uh, I had given up on God. I figured that God was obviously incompetent or just didn't care. All right, that was, uh, that's, uh, there, uh, I've been through this with God. You don't have to worry. There's not a lightning bolt coming right now. Okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I've, God and I have worked this out. All right. But, but I figured that God was, you know, I figured, I'd given up on God. God wasn't meeting my expectations, you see. And I'd given up on God. And I, I joke around about this, about how, how when I got... Old enough to have a driver's license and a set of car keys, I, I put church in the rearview mirror and stepped on the gas as hard as I could, you know. And, and I determined that I would live fast, die laughing. And, and it, I aligned myself, myself with those dark enemies of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I aligned myself with them. I was with them. And, and, and you know... There was something, though, that, that happened every year. That, I, I used to tell people that, that, I, that I attended church regular as clockwork. And they'd say, really? I'd say, yeah, once a year. <laughs> once a year. And, and, and you know, I, I, I did. Because, you see, you see, I had heard an old, old story about a king who came from glory. You know, I had, I had heard an old, old story about a Savior. A Savior who came from glory, who came to this earth. And I needed to come. I needed to come to see. You know, I, I knew that, that Easter Sunday would be the only day of the year that I knew for sure that the topic would be an empty tomb. I can go to church any other day of the week, any other, any other Sunday of the year, I can go to church... And, and, and learn about the cross. Okay, I can, I can encounter the cross any Sunday I want to. But I knew for sure that on this Sunday of the year, there would be an empty tomb. And I had to see that empty tomb. Because, you see, I figured I like Peter. You know, I said how I said that that, that used to be my favorite verse, Luke twenty two thirty two. but I have prayed for you. That your faith may not fail. I figured I was like Peter. I had, if, I, if I was to encounter a living, risen Christ, I had the most to gain and I had the most to lose. And I figured that he was disappointed in me because it, I believe it was age 11. I said, I am yours, Lord. 
And there I was lined up with, with the devil himself. I figured, I figured that, that, that I had the most to gain and the most to lose. But, but you know what? Once a year I had to come back. And I'm going to tell you what. That, that my faith on life support had something breathed into it. By people just like you. Because, because as I came and sat among that big congregation. There in the presence of an empty tomb. And a risen Lord. There was like this, this power that came into me. And the power of the kingdom of God, of God overcame the powers that be in my life. Yeah. I had to see. What are we expecting? What are we expecting today? You know, the empty tomb tells us that the powers that be have their day. They have their moment. They have, they have their dark period. And that's the same today, 2,000 years later, as it was then. Yes, there is bad stuff going on. There's a war going on. There's, there's suffering going on. There's terrible things going on. The empty tomb tells us that the sun rises and the tomb is empty and we have a risen Lord. What are we expecting today? Yeah. You know... Expect something unexpected. Expect the Lord Jesus Christ because the, because, the, because the risen Lord is here. The risen Lord is here with us today. You know, I, don't, you know I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have anything to do with a Savior that was not here and now. I, I wouldn't want any, you know, I wouldn't be here at all. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you anything at all about Jesus if it was just something that was, that was something for later on. Or maybe he was off somewhere and, and, and we're on our own until then. No, we have a risen Savior who's here now. I would have nothing to do with a salvation that some sweet by and by pie in the sky kind of, kind of somewhere wait later on. No, it has to be something right now. Saved here and now. That has to be what it is. I want to know that that God still kills giants. I want to know that God still parts waters. I want to put my hands in the hand of a Savior and tread on the waves in the midst of the storm, here and now. That's what I want. And that is what is ours, here and now. Because brothers and sisters, children of God, friends and neighbors, the tomb is empty. Yeah. The tomb is empty. Let's, let's pray as we, as we come this time in our worship service. Mighty God, we call upon you now to touch us with the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, come into our lives right now and breathe into our souls that spirit of life. That we might live as you live. That we might live with power over the world around us and, and over the death that confronts us. That we might live with joy. That we might live with a sense of hope for the future. Lord, bring life to our bodies this day. Bring life to our souls this day. Bring life to our prayers. Bring life to our, our, our family visits that we'll have. Bring life to our, our testimonies, our, our, our smiles, our, the stories that we tell. Bring life into our lives for this day and forevermore. Remind us of a time, O oh Lord, right now. Remind us of a time when you were with us, though we did not know it. Bring it to our hearts right now. When you walked with us. Let that surprise be a surprise, something unexpected for each of us. And let that memory, and let that unexpected surprise be your assurance to us that you shall be ours and we shall be yours forevermore. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so today we have a closing hymn. It's one of my favorites. I, I've had enough coffee now that I might be able to hit the note in the chorus, but I'm not going to promise anything. Turn your mic off. Turn my mic off. Thank you very much. 
I invite you to stand with me as we sing He Lives. It's number 310 in the back of your hymnal. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it's been a real, a real joy. Uh, have a great Easter. We've got just a few reminders as we venture forth. Flowers today are simply in celebration of Easter. So praise God for that. We thank you for the uh, non-perishable food items that you have brought up uh, to the altar. We will be giving those to the uh, community food closet a little bit later on in the week. We are closed. The offices are closed. Tomorrow, Lynn is all brokenhearted about that. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we won't be here tomorrow. Let's see. Our, but the United Methodist Women's Craft Team will be here tomorrow. So if you'd like to join them for crafting, they're getting ready for the uh, uh, craft fair that we have in November. So uh, please come for that. Uh, you don't have to have had any crafting experience. I tried it for a while, and they <laughs> suffered through it. So uh, uh, member care, this meeting, this meeting this Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. And Holy Humor Sunday is next week. Just giving you a heads up, uh, there's a tradition in the church whereby the week, the Sunday after uh, Easter, we, uh, we, we just have fun, okay? And there will be a message. It will have meaning, okay? But it will be a pretty lighthearted uh, service, uh, very brief. Uh, uh, everything's going to be fairly brief. Uh, attention span will not be required. Uh, <laughs> Just come and, and enjoy. The, uh, I'll give you a heads up, though. The, the, uh, the theme is cowboys. Okay. So, uh, so it, you can have lots of fun with, with cowboy stuff. Okay. So uh, we will do that. Uh, let's see. And I guess that's it. Um, if you have purchased an Easter lily, please take them with you today. If there are any left tomorrow when the women have their craft time and anybody else who comes in the church this week, take them. Okay. All right. So... If you have, if, for those of you who may not have heard that, and those of you who may be watching on YouTube, if you have purchased a lily, please pick it up sometime today. By tomorrow, whatever lilies are left will be fair game. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, let's receive our benediction. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever as we go in peace. Amen.